First call for in five nine. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. All right, going back to chapter 4, verse 16, it says at the rapture, Michael the archangel's voice sounds, and this would indicate a Jewish dispensation is coming back in, and the day of the Lord is starting, chapter 5, verse 2, and the wrath that's poured out at the day of the Lord he is not going to get the Christian. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now that wrath there is plainly tribulation wrath, or the wrath that has to do with the second advent. And they gather this from two places. Uh, first of all, turn to Matthew chapter 3, where there's an advent passage. And then turn to uh, Revelation, where there's a tribulation passage. Revelation, uh, oh, no, I think 16. Yeah. On right, Revelation 16, now if you start the uh, day of the Lord with the advent, you're not going to get the wrath. And if you start it with Daniel's 70th week, you're not going to get the wrath. Either way. All right, Matthew 3, verse uh, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, watch it, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What's the context? Verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, as the threshing floor, the stomping and the cutting, and gather his wheat into the garner, some kind of a rapture, but burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Second Advent passage. Uh, 10, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. All right, now a tribulation passage. Revelation 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. And this is in the tribulation. As you can see by verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the end of the tribulation isn't till verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now depending upon... Where you place the wrath, it depends how much deliverance you have. Now, if you make the wrath of God over here, then you're delivered from the wrath to come there by getting saved. But in two places where I read you, the wrath of God had nothing to do with that. One place I read had to do with here, where the beasts gather together and the Lord comes down in and comes in Second Thessalonians in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and obey our Lord Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter 4, the day shall burn us up, and the wicked shall be burned up, and that he be ashes under your feet. Matthew chapter 3, he shall burn the chaff of unquenchable fire, who would warn you to flee from the wrath to come. This one, this one. So the Christian is not appointed to that. Therefore, you're not going to be there. Now the question is, how soon before there do you get caught up? Well, one reference I read you, John said, he'll gather the wheat into the garden, but burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So in this dispensation, you have people that teach the church will go through the tribulation in the here and he caught up over here. That's called post-tribulation rapture. And it's real popular now at uh, Tennessee Temple in Dallas, Moody in Florida and Columbia and some in Springfield. I'm not saying the teaching. I'm the student to talk about it about it. And some of the professors are taking a neutral position. They're not committing themselves. All right, now, I know one thing. I know I am going to get caught up for there. Now, how do I know it? I read in Revelation, the vials of the wrath were poured upon, out upon the earth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven vials of wrath have to be poured out before the Lord comes back. And the text you read in First Thessalonians 5 said, God hath not appointed us to wrath here. So I can get back to here. I can get back to mid-tribulation. So, you have a bunch of ministerial students today teaching mid-tribulation rapture. And they're saying the Christian goes into the middle of Daniel's 70th week, and then is caught up in the middle, mid-tribulation rapture. 
and there's some, there's some evidence for it. Now, I don't buy it for a number of reasons, but the main reason I don't buy it is Daniel's 70th week is Daniel's 70th week. It's not the 70th week for the body of Christ, it's Daniel. Daniel's an Old Testament Jew. And when Daniel's 70th week starts, I've got no business in that, in that week. I'm not part of Daniel, I'm not part of Daniel's people. And uh, when Daniel's 70th week starts, Temple worship is going on here because he said in Daniel chapter 9, in the end of the week, the uh, sacrifice was cut off with the abomination of desolation, the middle of the week. Then they were sacrificing here and then start the sacrifice there. What they're sacrificing here, I have no part in that. My sacrifice is back over there. So I take for granted I'm leaving before Daniel 70th week starts. Now it isn't too uh, easy to prove. But uh, when you get all the scripture together, you can hardly get any other position. Now, there's some things I know for certain. I know for certain. I'm, I know for certain. I'm not going into here. I know for certain. I'm not going into here. Too much question about it. All right, First Thessalonians five. First Thessalonians five nine. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice salvation spoken of in the future, but to obtain salvation, but already have it. But notice the context of salvation of my body. See, go back to chapter four, verse uh, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen talking about the salvation of the body, not the soul. All right, 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, the bodies, who died for us, and whether we wake, that's the body, or sleep, that's the body, we should live together with him. All right, whether I'm down here awake in the sense of living, I'm with Christ, and if I'm dead in the sense of sleeping and my body sleeps, I'm with Christ, and I'm told in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, that the body is sleep, not the soul, the body. Therefore, the reference in verse 19, or 9 and 10 is to my body. All right, verse 10, who died for us, and whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Now, we can't know everything exactly about the intermediate state between uh, when we die and when we get our new bodies. And the ladies and I were studying that in visitation here a couple of Thursday mornings back in the Second Corinthians 5, and it's real difficult to say exactly how it was going to be, because it isn't, too, it isn't too clear. But there's one thing that's certain. Verse 10 says, He died for us, and whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. So whatever it is, if you were to die right this minute, you'd live. You'd not be unconscious. You'd live. And you'd live with Him. So you'd be gone. All right, 11, wherefore comfort yourselves together. That's about the reading you had, maybe on that paper. <laughs> wherefore comfort yourselves together, uh, comfort each other, and edify one another, even as also you do. Now, to comfort another Christian is to say words to him that will be a help to him and comfort him and ease pain or sorrow, and to edify is to say words to a Christian to help him out in the sense of enlightenment or understanding. A little bit different. I mean, some things you get for understanding don't comfort you a bit. And some of the things that you get for comfort don't contribute to your understanding. It's two kinds of encouragement. Yes? Uh, back to this wake or sleep, is there anywhere where wake or sleep can be applied to the soul, like using it with on stage and stage? But even in that, can you even apply wake and sleep to the soul in that sense? I can't think of any place in the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament you might, but not in the New. All right, 12, that we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, it looks kind of like a hierarchy, but it's not over in the sense of uh, lording it over, or only in the sense of, well, he says, verse 13, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, in that sense. I'll compare this with 1 Timothy 5, 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. And the over there is just somebody sent to watch over or care over. It's not like a hierarchy. It isn't like some Christian at the bottom and some on the top. 
Or at 1 Timothy 5.17, this will bring it out a little clearer. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And, of course, a little bit different than the modern counterpart. In the modern counterpart, they, uh, they don't pay much more attention to word and doctrine. The labor is in everything except word and doctrine. But in the Bible, he says the one that's worthy of double honor is the one who labors in word and doctrine. 18, for the scripture saith, and then he quotes the passage for the ministry out of 1 Corinthians 9 and Deuteronomy, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward, like the ministry in 1 Corinthians 9, and so forth and so on. All right, there's one more like this in Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. <coughs> Hebrews 13, verse... Uh, 17. Now this rule here is like maintaining the rule, that is, keeping up the, the right practice or setting the standards. It isn't like uh, a king on a throne, a basilica with a scepter. Now that's very clear from 1 Peter chapter 5 that says the, the uh, elders should not lord it over the flock. Or right, Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. That's a rough one. If they may do it with joy, not with grief, for this is unprofitable for you, so forth and so on. And somebody who has charge of maintaining the rule and watching over souls will be, have to give account for the souls. Now, it's, it's wonderful, therefore, not to be responsible for anybody but yourself. The Bible says uh, every one of us should give account of himself to God. But a person given any kind of rule or authority is then responsible for the people under them. And that's double responsibility. I never can understand why people wanted authority and power. Never able to understand. Never understand the day I die. Because the more you get, the more responsibility you got. And it just doubles and triples and triples. But there's some people in this world, some Christians, some of the brethren, that are just as ambitious as Charlemagne and Napoleon. I never can understand. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, you can apply it to gifts of government, uh, gifts of government for the uh, church. But if you make it political, you're in a mess because it says they watch over your souls, and the government don't watch over your soul. <laughs> they watch over your pocketbook. <laughs> but those things there, the more, the more, the more authority you have, the more responsibility you're going to be. And it's especially true, I learned it in the army. But as I began as a private, and then a corporal, and then a sergeant, and then a lieutenant. And I noticed as the thing went up, the more it got up, the more pain in the neck you had. And then I noticed when you got in the... I have got a hemetic blood in me, but I... But I you, you know, there's something about that ambitious get to the top that just... It hardly pays for itself. Uh, you get up there, the safest man in combat's not a lieutenant. And it's not a captain. A buck, it's a buck private. It wasn't the infantry. I don't know how it is in the Marines. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know the statistics, but I bet you there's more liquor flowing in Washington, D.C. than any place in the world. Because that's where the responsibility is right now. I bet that's a drunken hole. Oh, yeah. A little slow there. All right, First Thessalonians 5, uh, 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and know the ones that are doing the work. We beseech you, brethren, to know them in, in local church to be your officers. Deacons, trustees, superintendents, know them which labor among you, the ones that are doing the work, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love, for their work's sake. It's kind of like the army saluting the uniform, you salute the work, not always a person. And be at peace among yourselves, which is difficult to do for Baptist churches. <laughs> now, 
Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, that don't follow the rule. That's how the word rule is used, you see. We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Of course, the main instrument for that is the Scripture. Comfort the feeble-minded. The Bible lays no precedent for persecuting insane people, locking them up in, you know, in a dungeon like the Catholics used to do. Uh, Catholics never could get it right. In the dark ages, they're locking them up and putting chains on them and all that kind of business. The New Testament says comfort them. Comfort them, not whip them and persecute them. Comfort the feeble-minded. Why should you comfort the feeble-minded? Because the Lord made some of them. Uh, I'll take you by them and turn to Exodus 4.11. Exodus 4.11. Most people don't think about this. Uh, one time an inmate of an asylum left it after being in there for about 12 years. And as she walked by a new doctor coming in, she said, Doctor, did you ever thank God for your sanity? Something to think about. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. Most of us just take it for granted. But look at this. Exodus 4, 11, The Lord speaking to Moses. And the Lord said, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who baketh the dumb? For the can't talk. Or deaf, the thought can't hear. Or the seeing, or the blind. Have not I the Lord? Have not I the Lord? Turn to Job 12, verse 20. Job 12, verse 20. I know what science says. They said it's already in the environment, all this stuff. Job chapter 12, verse 20. Job 12, verse 20. And begin at verse uh, 16. Job 12, 16. Job 12, 16. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counselors away, spoil, and maketh the judges fools. He looseth the bonds of kings, and girdeth their loins with a girdle. He leadeth prince away, spoil, and overthroweth the mighty. He removeth away the speech of the trusty, and taketh away the understanding of the aged. So we say senile, or up in years. The Lord does it, not nature. Some is just the outworking of nature. Well, it's the Lord working through nature, but it's the Lord. Yes. Well, it's just showing God's all. He just he has he has all power. He doesn't do it from all the ages. It's just saying that that He's able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the mark. That's one of the first marks. And the first said the same thing in a period of, a, say, 15 or 20 minutes. That shows the mind not keeping track of what they're doing. And it doesn't always... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, it doesn't, always, it doesn't always happen, though, you know. For example, uh, I don't know a boy up in, uh, in uh, Utah, Hale County, Alabama, and he's Richard Pearson Hobson's grandson. And you wouldn't know Richard Pearson Hobson was unless you were a southerner. <laughs> but he was his grandson, and uh, he's up now in his 80s. And that fellow, I've seen him about three times in the last 10 years since he was 70, and he's he just bright and chipper and quick as you ever saw. It. And he knows everybody coming by there and remembers all the names. I didn't see him one time between, I didn't see him one period in there for about seven years, and he knew me as soon as he came in. And I hadn't even been in the, in the state for years. And he has business come there all the time, and lives in an antebellum home that's a tourist attraction. So he may see anywhere from an average of uh, 10 to 20 people a day. And mine just as sharp as can be. Some of them like that, some of them aren't. All right, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Help out weak folks. Be patient toward all. And man is inserted, but should be there. Everybody. Be patient toward all, not only toward saved, but unsaved. And not only toward unsaved, but saved. And many times it's much easier to be patient toward an unsaved man than a saved man. See that none render evil for evil to any man. That's part of your patience. But ever follow. But do your best. Work at it. Ever follow. Like you're following something down the street. And stay at it. But ever follow that which is good. 
both among yourselves, Christians, and to all unsaved, which is why I mentioned unsaved back in 14. See, to all, saved or lost, both among yourselves and to all men. That is some short, brief exhortation, kind of a like a New Testament Ten Commandments. Uh, first one is 16, rejoice evermore. That is, uh, rejoice all the time. i got a note here in comfort the feeble-minded. Insanity is hereditary. You get it from your children. <laughs> <laughs> all right, 16, rejoice evermore. That is, keep rejoicing. And that's hard. That's hard. Uh, it's easy in a revival meeting, you know, and they're singing, oh, he is wonderful, he is marvelous, you know, on the platform lifting up in the air. That's great, boy, you can do it then. And then you get home after the service, you know, and something else. And that's Monday and Tuesday morning getting up at 6 and 6.30, and then it's hard. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Rejoice evermore. 17, commandment. Pray without ceasing. Stay at it all the time. Don't quit praying. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Well, we had one of them before. One of them was 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Here's the second one, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. This is the will of God. The missionary field? No. This is the will of God. The pastor? No. This is the will of God. To go someplace? No. This is the will of God. What's the will of God? The will of God is in everything, in everything, give thanks. That's the will of God. And that isn't easy. Matter of fact, it's so difficult that over here in Hebrews chapter 13, we read about a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Hebrews chapter 13, verse uh, 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Because many times it's a sacrifice to thank God. It costs you something. It hurts. It hurts. Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. There's one of them. To God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, which is what? Giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks to his name, that's a sacrifice of praise, he says. All right, First Thessalonians 5, 18, out of two readings, we'll take both of them in verse 18. All right, the first reading is this. In everything give thanks for... Everything is the will of God in Christ Jesus. But if anything that happens to you is God's will. For example, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God who the call according to his purpose. That's the first reading. In everything give thanks for this. Everything that happens to you. Everything that happens to you is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But it can't happen to you unless the Lord lets it. All right, the second reading, which is a little more scriptural, is in everything give thanks for this, the giving of thanks. In everything give thanks for this, the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say for everything give thanks for this, the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you, which some Christians read. Some Christians, they thank God for everything. Well, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's good. But that is exactly what the verse says. The verse says, in everything. That is, while the thing is going on, during it, and in it, while you're going through it, thank God. That's what he's saying. All right, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And sometimes we seek the will of God. We talk about, Lord, show me your will, show me your will. Uh, we don't get very far because we're not thanking God for the messes we're in right now. And the mess you're in right now, give thanks now. On everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ. Uh, it's high ground. It's high ground. I don't profess to. I, I'm no expert on it. I, don't, I back out. I resign. I'm out. I don't. I, I'll tell you, when I, when, I, when I come to a thing like this, I think about somebody. I always think about somebody like Mrs. Sawyer or somebody like uh, the Shell family. They lost out a little boy, a 10-year-old boy. And you can stand, you can say everything, give thanks, you're blue in the face, brother. But do you've gone through it, you don't know how much a sacrifice it is. Yes. Uh, I forget, yes. That's why I said the second reading was a little more scriptural than the first one. Because the first one is like the two preachers, you know, on the slip on the ice going out the 
front doorstep of the church and say, well, thank God that's over with, you know, <laughs> predestinated from the foundation of the world. <laughs> All right, 518, and everything give thanks for this, the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Uh, quench not the Spirit. Now that there is not like put out, it isn't like put out the Holy Spirit in your body like that, but quench not the Spirit in his dealing with you. That is, don't put the snuffer on what the Lord is doing. Don't, don't drown out what the Spirit is trying to do with you. And notice, especially in the context, that refusal to give thanks, 18, tends to quench the Spirit, prevents the Spirit from doing what he wants to do. One place in, uh, in uh, Ephesians says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed the day of redemption. And that passage on Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, I think that has to do with uh, uh, fussing and fighting. I think. Ephesians, yeah, 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, so forth and so on. All right, 19, quench not the Spirit. Now, there's another context. Look at, look at verse 19 and verse 20. Verse 20, despise not prophesying. And then when the Holy Spirit is trying to get prophecy across to you, don't quench the Holy Spirit in the sense of don't despise the prophesying. That's, that's a sense. And that matches the sense better than the other. Now, verse 19, 20, and 21 come right together. Quench not the Spirit when he's working. Despise not prophesying. He works through prophecy. The Holy Spirit, when he has come, will show you things to come. Wait a minute. Don't believe everything you hear prophesied. 21, prove all things. I mean, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. I could have somebody from the Seventh-day Adventist Church come in here tonight and talk to you, to you an hour on prophecy and get you so messed up you wouldn't wish where you were going. I could have some of the Joel witnesses come in and talk to you two hours on prophecy. They always begin with Matthew 24. I never talked to Jehovah's Witness in my life. Didn't begin in Matthew chapter 24. All right, when a man starts prophesying, don't say, hmm, you know, that stuff, you know, that isn't practical. Don't do that. Look at here, 21, 21, prove it. Prove all things. Prove it. Test it out. Prove all things. Hold fast. That which is good. Verse 20, in a sense of prophecy, you see. Prove it. Put it to the test. All right, we'll close there. Verse, uh, we'll go back over. We haven't exhausted that yet. We'll go back to verse 19 next time. Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, verse where? 21. First Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things, uh, particularly in regards to prophesying. Verse 20. Prove all things. See if they work out the way the prophet said they'd work out. If the prophet prophesies something and it doesn't come out that way, then he's not from the Lord. Uh, come to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. And look at the rules on prophecy. The rules on prophecy. Deuteronomy 18. Now, there's a case where even though what the man says comes to pass, you're not to listen to him. But that case there is a case if a prophet shows up to turn you from the Lord God to another God. Now, that prophet may be able to prophesy the truth, but you're not paying attention to him. All right, Deuteronomy 18, uh, verse 21. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh a thing, speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. The false prophet is characterized by making prophecies that do not come true. And so if you hear a preacher or a prophet stand up and say, we'll work for peace, peace is coming. If we all work for peace, we'll bring in peace. And the peace summit, the peace conference, and the Paris peace talks, we hope we'll soon have peace. Then he's a false prophet. Because there's no peace in this age where Christ comes back. When a man prophesies of peace, then you're not paying attention to him. He's a liar. And if a man prophesies the Jews are not going to be restored like the post-millennial teachers and preachers did of a hundred years ago, and prophesies God's all through with the Jew, and the church gets the Jews' promises, 
and then you see Israel go back to Palestine and become a nation, then you know the post-millennial teacher or preacher is a liar. And it is not the Lord, and the Lord hath not spoken by him. That means that uh, 90% of the teachers and preachers in the 19th century were liars. They were false prophets. 90% of the conservatives, because 90% of the conservatives were post-millennial in the 19th century. They weren't premillennial. So if the man says it's going to come and doesn't come, then don't pay attention to it. Well, I come to Deuteronomy chapter 13, and notice there's an exception in the case of people like Edgar Casey and Gene Dixon. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. And Martin Luther King. 13, 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, a dreamer of dreams, I had a dream, and give thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. See, he said it's going to come to pass, and then it does. Where have he spoken to thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet, of that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul. So in that case there, in the case where the prophet prophesies something, says Kennedy's going to get shot, and then Kennedy gets shot, but the prophet is trying to get you to abandon this word and go to a crystal ball or the snake that gets in the bed with her at night, wraps around her, and looks into her eyes, or the couch where Edgar Casey goes to sleep and then prophesies in his sleep and the guy takes it down shorthand, if that's what it is, don't pay attention to it. Even to what the man prophesies comes to pass, don't pay attention to it. And that's what I talked to you about about two Sundays ago on Ouija boards and that kind of thing and tarot cards and all that. If you mess around that Ouija board and that Ouija board says there'll be an accident today at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at the corner of Savannah's and uh, Palafox, and then the, there turns out to be one, you don't pay attention to it. Because it's trying to get you to consult it instead of the Lord. So that's how those things work. All right, First Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast to that which is good. Keep it. Hold fast, that which is good. Is the King James Bible good? Amen. Hold it fast. Hold it fast. Don't let it slip. Bob Jones Singer used to say, American people are the craziest people in the world. He said, if they get something that works, they know the thing works, then they keep trying to change it. Now, if the thing doesn't work, then it needs some changing or some working on and some revision. But if it works, why, why mess with it? And American people are the dumbest people in the world. They get something that works, and then they tinker with it and tinker with it and tinker with it to where it doesn't work. And this revision and amendment and changing it. And the idea is you can, there's always room for improvement. That's the idea. The idea is if you keep messing with it, it's bound to get better. If you mess with it, it might get worse. So here's a book, and he says, hold fast to that which is good. Now, here's a book here. I've never known it to prophesy anything that didn't come to pass. Have you? All right, if it prophesies it comes to pass and it's the Lord's book, then why exchange it for something else? Hold fast to that which is good. It's good. Hold fast to it. All right, verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Change in all the newer translations to uh, abstain from every appearance of evil. Like in uh, Nestle's text, recommended at Bob Jones in Tennessee Temple and Fuller Moody and Dallas and Bowen and Philadelphia School of the Bible and the other 500. Uh, verse 22, uh, from every form of evil abstain. And thus the New American Standard, ASV, RSV, Moffat, Weymouth, Mickey Mouse, Goodspeed, Charlie Brown, and all that stuff. All right, now 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil is a closer line and now is it down closer than abstain from every form of evil. There wouldn't be any reason to tell a Christian here abstain from every form of evil. He'd know that. Anybody here knows that. But the thing that says abstain from all appearance of evil, and uh, people judge largely by appearances. So the Christian is not to appear evil, even if he's good. He's not to appear evil. If inside he's good, he's, he's not to act like folks that aren't. But that's one thing wrong with the long hair for the boys. As soon as you see one of those fellows like that, you think... Well, he's this, that, and the other. Now, he may not be. He may not be. I mean, Billy Graham would get up and say, Well, I'm, thank goodness, people uh, have better sense to judge people by their appearance and look on the heart, you know, and let these kids go. 
I talk to the fellow downtown every day. He said, I'd hire a guy that wore his hair like that as long as he kept it clean. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. You wash it and put it up in curlers, boys. And <laughs> kept it clean. Shampoo it, you know. And dry. I guess get a hair dryer for it. <laughs> and he said, uh, as long as, you know, he was, uh, you know, acted right. Well, that's true, but the thing is, it doesn't look right. And somebody says, well, I, you can't tell people are going to judge you anyway. Yeah, and they're going to damn you anyway. They're going to talk about you anyway. Yeah. But there's a line there. There's a line. There's a line there between paying too much attention to what folks think and trying to meet their demands and everything, which is too far over. And a devil may care who gives a blankety-black attitude where let them go ahead and talk. Who cares? There's that, see? And that's over on the other side. And the attitude of this modern generation is, let them talk, who cares? That's the attitude. There's no regard for how it looks at all. I see these bums out here on the highway with their hair down the back of their uh, neck, and if I was going to give them a ride, I don't give them one. And uh, one of those fellows told me one time, he said, it's a sign that you're in, you belong. He said, when you get out there and hitchhike, why, they know what you stand for, and they'll pick you up. You mean another one like that will pick you up. Uh, if I was a bum out there, I'd be trying to get some money, wouldn't you? Well, the establishment has the money, so I'd cut my hair to attract one of them. I wouldn't have it grown down around my neck someplace. And appearance of evil. Appearance of evil is also true of uh, sometimes the women when it comes to makeup. Now, you don't have to say a whole lot about makeup these days because none of the hippies wear it. But you know, about uh, ten years ago, women had makeup, mascara on, like a girl up in, in the choir one time, uh, I winked at an evangelist I know that came through here, and had her eyelid stuck. She had so much mascara in the eyelid, and she was back there trying to pry that thing open. And one guy said, which is probably stretching it, he probably said that if you had so much uh, lipstick on your kiss her, you get lead poisoning, <laughs> which is probably stretching it. But you know, uh, oh, ten years ago, everybody used to paint up. And those old homeless preachers get up and say, Oh, today it's a sin, you know, lip sick is a sin, you know, paint up like a possum under and poke berry time and all this business. Rat, roar, and pound. And then those homeless people got thinking if they wore the right kind of makeup, they were holy. So they all quit wearing makeup, and then the hippies quit wearing it. That sure messed that thing up, didn't it? So that's why I don't say a great deal about it, see? And uh, they got all kinds of saying. One of these, well, the evangelistic standard saying is, Every old, every, let's see, every old barn uh, looks better with a coat of paint on it, you know, it's, you know, hard thing. Like, I don't say those things, but some of the brethren do. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you're in a thing there where uh, as long as it doesn't appear like you're a prostitute, then it's all right. But the makeup doesn't determine it. Uh, if you went to a homeless meeting, much of Church of God and Assembly of God people, you know what you'd find? You'd find no makeup and three-quarter length sleeve and hair down the middle of the back just like Joanne Baez. And then you'd find dresses uh, uh, tighter than a skin diver suit and red shoes and flower bouquets as big as your head. And you know what they're for? They're to get attention. That's what they're for. You know what that is? That's flesh. Just like the other. Like the other. All right. Uh, 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't drink a bottle of water out of a Four Roses bottle out in public. <laughs> if there was, I could go out and I could sit down in the corner, you know, and take a Four Roses bottle or a secret cell and fill it full of water and drink it. It wouldn't be whiskey, it'd be water, right? What's wrong with that? Well, the thing is the appearance. doesn't appear right. And so you have to be careful of those things. You can't, you can't cover them all. I mean, you'll, you'll mess up. You'll mess up occasionally. You can't, you can't win them all. Oh, they used to have a juke joint over here between the, us and the highway, and the, it's a taco place now, but it was a nightclub. And uh, I'd often, you know, to avoid this 15-minute uh, stop here for these women getting through the four lanes, I'd cut through there and go out the other side. And uh, I, like, uh, I like Slim Jims. You know what Slim Jims are? That's a hot sausage about this long, and it comes wrapped in cellophane that's brown. See? And when you drive with both hands, you know, you can't uh, <laughs> do everything. So you take that thing and bite off that uh, cellophane wrapper, see, and then push the Slim Jim into your mouth. Well, as soon as you bite off that end, pull it and pull that wrapper off, you know what it looks like. I mean, you can't miss it, man. And I often thought, boy, somebody see me come out of that uh, 
going through that place, you know, that duke joint. I have to church Sunday night with this thing in my mouth, you know. I saw Brother Ruckman. I saw him light up a cigar. He came staggering drunk out of that place. You know. <laughs> I'm, they'll, they'll always dress it up for you, boy. They'll fix you up good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I, I had a meeting one time, and I, well, I had a lot of meetings in hotels where it got kind of rough next door. And I recall one in St. Louis where it went on all night, and I phoned up the manager one time, got them run out, and they came back in at three and started again. So I took some uh, tracks and stuck them under the door near the other bedroom. And the next day when I got up and went out the door, I thought they left their whiskey bottles in front of my door. <laughs> See, I gave them my word and they gave me theirs, you know. But I thought, I wouldn't have been some of the pastor of that church had come up to get me that morning to go out visiting. And come up there and see those whiskey bottles out in front of that door. I thought, I've done this. I'm going to a room in a motel where I had a meeting and pull open the drawer and there had been a whiskey bottle in the drawer. Now, that's happened a number of times. And then your problem is what to do with it. I mean, if you leave it there and somebody finds you have the room, you know, he's been drinking. And if you take it and set it outside and somebody sees you, well, he killed the pint, you know, and left it out out there. And if you try to smuggle it out and get caught at it, that'd really be rough, you know. <laughs> Put it under your pocket, got halfway out the door and dropped it. <laughs> and uh, drop them out the window, somebody see it, and smash out in the alley, you know. It's, it's really, really a problem. I have been known to have that happen and take thing at night, wait till 10 o'clock at night, and then open the door, open the window, and take that thing and throw it into a, a lock across the street at night. <laughs> All right, 23. <laughs> and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've been through this with you before, and some of you had it so you know it by heart, but I won't hurt to have a view for some of you. And uh, you need to get these three terms down and understand what they are. Uh, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. And notice the uh, Bible makes a clear distinction between the three of them. I never spoken of as the same. They're always different. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says the, Holy, the Word of God is able to divide the sunder between the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow for in the body. So the, the Bible speaks of a spirit, a soul, and a body for the Christian. And the verse says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, maybe not. I mean, we may get blamed at the judgment seat of Christ for some things. But still, 24, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. That is, the Lord will do it if you let him. The God of peace sanctify you holy. He will do it. See, he'll do it. And it's like that thing over there in, uh, in Philippians where it says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But as the Lord is doing it, uh, as how much of it you let him do, that's something else. But he's able to preserve you blameless. That's what the verse says. He's able to do it. All right, now these three things here mark the trinity of man, and we call this in theology a trichotomy. And a trichotomy simply means uh, three parts. Uh, Presbyterian theology teaches dichotomy, and most scholars, but the Bible has three. All right, you have a body. God's body is Jesus Christ. Christ said, He that has seen me hath seen the Father. This word in Greek looks like this, soma. And when a psychologist speaks of psychosomatics, he's talking about psuche soma, psychosomal, soul-body relationship, the effect of uh, emotions and things on the body. Or that the soma, in Hebrew that thing looks like that, it's called basar, and it means uh, flesh or meat, the body of flesh. And